First thing I'd like to do is welcome you here with the song. 9-11 uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, publicly played music, uh, but there's an awful lot of it out there. One of the organizations that uh, has been promoting it is 9-11 uh, Truth Outreach, and um, we uh, have a collection of songs uh, that we've been promoting in something we call uh, Trusic, the Truth in Music video. Um, this one, this one here is uh, not part of that collection, but it's one of my favorites um, because music is what has inspired many people in the '60s to uh, become active and to get informed. And so, this is a um, uh, uh, Sharon uh, Aberu who uh, uh, will sing a song called uh, "Still Asking Why," and then we'll uh, launch into our program. Today is just kind of 
uh, hit some of the high points. Some of the things that um, I, I believe resonate with people who, uh, who uh, are still unclear about what actually happened and still in the trance, the, the media-induced trance that uh, the, uh, the planes knocked down uh, two towers, three towers. Uh, just as a show of hands, how many here uh, have any doubts at all that uh, it was some form of explosives that destroyed the Twin Towers? Is anyone, everyone here, okay, raise your hands if you think it was. Uh, oh, right, great. So, uh, for the most part, we had, we were all uh, uh, well, on board with the fact that it was explosive. But I wanna, because not everyone is uh, on board, I will uh, go through some of the high-level uh, issues related to it. Uh, and I will, I'm really glad that uh, we have some people who are uh, still kind of questioning um, uh, what we say and still, and still willing to come here and, uh, and address this. So what, the first thing that we want to do is go through um, a side-by-side -side comparison of Building 7. Building 7 came down at 5.20 in the afternoon on September 11th. Uh, the building on the left is uh, uh, 47 story uh, building 7 and the, on the right hand side it was a known controlled demolition. Dan Rather that evening said that uh, it was also reminiscent of, of a... Um, Excuse me, you say known control or you say controlled demolition? Uh, the, one on the, right. the, the, the one on the right was a known controlled demolition. No, K-N-O-W. Known, right. known. Yes. Okay, I understood known. Right, yes. So, uh, we were showing it to show that they have very similar characteristics and that the buildings are, in fact, uh, coming down at what you call free-fall acceleration. Uh, this was supposed to have been caused by a small fire in the corner of uh, a building on 413. A major study was done, fraudulent, uh, that uh, uh, tried to put together a model of how the building was uh, failed. And you can see the entire steel structure bolted and welded it into place is just crumbling as if it was no more than a pile of uh, Jenga blocks put together. Uh, we, they will not release their uh, their calculations to architects and engineers uh, because, in fact, uh, we believe it's fraudulent and, is a, and uh, they've been uh, caught in uh, omissions of some key critical uh, factors. So the, the one on the, the right over here is a known controlled demolition and I believe someplace in Italy, a uh, building almost as big as the um, uh, build, uh, Building 7. Uh, if you want to know what a gravity-only collapse looks like, uh, this is a French uh, technique called veronage where they pull out the center line, and we'll see this again, uh, and notice the parts that are falling down, going down much faster than the roof line, which is, the, which is a key when I go and talk about uh, the what happens to the Twin Towers. We're going to see it again. Now, here what they do is they, they pull um, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, floors out of alignment, the top starts crushing down, and the thing that is to be uh, seen here is the top's coming down and there's material here that's falling much faster than, than, than the roof line is coming down. The roof line is going down at a slower rate because it has to do crushing work it, uh, energy has to be consumed, uh, breaking the building up instead of accelerating it down. When we get to the Twin Towers, we'll see that the, the demolition is proceeding as fast or faster than free fall acceleration. People say that the, that the Twin Towers cannot be a controlled demolition because they always start at the bottom. Well, this one here started at, at the top just to show that they can start any place. The key thing is if you stop blowing up a building, it stops coming apart. We'll see what happens uh, uh, in a few minutes there. So this one here started in the middle. It looks an awful lot like what happened to the Twin Towers. Uh, people say that the Twin Towers were flimsily built. In fact, they were extremely robust. Uh, they were the pride of America uh, as they were being built. And the core column, which uh, supported uh, the two-thirds of the gravity weight of the building, uh, and the perimeter columns uh, supported a third of the gravity. But this is a huge matrix of of uh, steel, huge steel uh, core columns uh, that were uh, destroyed on 9-11. These perimeter columns are four tons, they're bolted and welded into place, and on September 11th, um, uh, during the demolition, they'll be breaking the bolts, breaking the welds, and being ejected out at up to 70 miles an hour in all directions, uh, suggesting a huge amount of explosive energy uh, in the uh, center the core of the building. The, the, you can see the, the core columns here uh, in the center. Uh, 
these were all prefabbed and put in place. Um, it's going to be going slower than usual here. So it was a dense, it was a very dense, very strong uh, web, uh, starting off with a six, uh, six inch thick uh, steel at the, at the base and uh, tapering down to much thinner uh, quarter inch steel uh, uh, columns uh, at, the, at the roof line. These floor pans are going to be put into, put into place. Uh, they're going to have four to six inches of concrete on top of them. And uh, in, uh, there's two official stories about what, how the building came down. The first one has these uh, bolts that you see uh, floating in, uh, in, in the official, first official story they break. Uh, but because that would have uh, required the insurance companies to uh, not have to pay anything, uh, they, uh, in the final version, they held. Uh, now this is where we look at the North Tower demolition waves, and this is uh, where you're going to see uh, the top, of, we'll see it a couple of times, twice. Uh, you'll see the top coming down, but along the side here, you see this stuff is keeping up with the stuff that's falling in, in, the, in free fall. We'll see this uh, uh, a second time. And again, uh, things can't, things cannot uh, uh, go down and do damage at the same rate as stuff that's in free fall. That's steel and aluminum pieces uh, in free fall. And it can't go, go so far. And you can see going down just through the center line of the building is where the demolition is being, uh, there's a demolition wave going down through the center line. It can't be a gravity only collapse. Uh, it's too small a segment and it's going too fast. In the South Tower, uh, we'll see the same thing. Uh, what you see here is that the demolition is coming down and, and uh, floor by floor by floor by floor. You can see it on this side, this side, and a little bit on the other side from stuff being ejected out. The steel and aluminum that's been ejected out here uh, is out in free fall and doesn't have time to come down and obscure the next level of demolition. So this demolition is proceeding as fast or faster than free fall acceleration at this, at this uh, uh, part of the building. Uh, it's absolutely incredible um, for this to be, uh, be happening and explosives are the only thing that can be uh, causing it and basically <coughs> floor by floor by floor. Um, not, not huge massive explosives but uh, 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 a whole series of them. It can't be a pancake collapse. This is what the, the official story has uh, uh, suggests but uh, as you would imagine by the time you get to the bottom you'll be able to see floor 78 and 79 on top and floor 80 but they there's nothing there, and in fact, in the miracle of Ladder 6, the 13, uh, 13 survivors from Ladder 6, uh, what happens is they look up and they say, there's, they see blue sky. The uh, top of the South Tower, as you know, rotated up to 22 degrees, and with the angular momentum should have carried it uh, uh, down, because buildings have a lot of uh, structural integrity. Um, but uh, if you stop blowing up a building, uh, they stop coming apart, as I said. Here are some failed control demolitions. These failed control demolitions show that if you, you can drop a building five stories, and what will happen is the, the building will uh, stay together. It won't keep continue, continuing to, to crumble, uh, but it will stay together. Uh, and uh, this one's going to drop about eight stories. And again, it stops. It stops. Uh, and um, uh, once it stops blowing up the building, it doesn't keep coming apart. So the Twin Towers, by... Uh, by contrast, were destroyed by explosives all the way down. Now these people here probably didn't get their bonus for the day, uh, but it shows you that a building can actually roll over and stay together. The aerial view of the North Tower when it was being destroyed uh, shows uh, everything being going in all directions. This is the smoke that was drifting out of the windows. Uh, and there's nothing doing to crush it. I'll be presenting a paper uh, in, uh, in Europe this, uh, this uh, summer uh, talking about uh, some of the fraudulent analysis that's been done. Uh, and uh, I think with that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll close this part of this, uh, this session. I don't have, there's nothing else that we need to talk about there. Um, so that's, uh, that's the uh, background for what happened on uh, September 11th to the uh, Twin Towers and to Building 7. The official story is that uh, the, the planes uh, Planes and the fires were so intense that the buildings were destroyed, and it's been—it uh, doesn't stand up any scrutiny at all. The consequence of all this is that uh, the alleged 19 Muslim hijackers, Islamic uh, Islamic uh, jihadists, 
were the ones that uh, caused this. And as a result, we all know uh, what happened uh, to the uh, American Muslim uh, community uh, and the worldwide Muslim community as uh, the, um, the anger and the rage uh, of what happened on September 11th uh, permeated through our, so our society. What I'd like to do next is uh, invite David uh, Schlesinger to uh, give a give a talk. Uh, That'll be Maury next. Oh, Maury's next. Okay. Thank uh, uh, you. Introduce Maury. Well, Maury is a uh, very dedicated activist for uh, the rights of Muslims in this country, and um, um, travels a, a goodly amount uh, on that behalf. He's a poet and. Um, uh, at the UNAC conference a couple of weeks ago in Jersey, it's the first time a Muslim speaker actually uh, acknowledged the uh, the lies involved with 9/11. They all uh, all the Muslims uh, who have ever spoken at uh, at the UNAC conferences over the years were too uh, frightened to uh, make that admission. Um, and if, if you want to say more in the introduction uh, of yourself, that'd be that'd be fine. That's, that's, uh, that's quite enough. First of all, I want to. Uh, what's up? 20? 25? First of all, I want to, I want to begin by uh, thanking uh, David and, and Wayne for giving me this opportunity to uh, represent the voice of. Uh, Muslims in America who are not afraid uh, to acknowledge uh, or to uh, aid in the dispelling of certain sacred cows within the within this this socio-political construct that has us all in its grip. 9-11 and what is alleged to have happened according to the official narrative on 9-11 is one of the sacred cows that many otherwise uh, courageous voices within alternative media uh, within the human rights and civil liberties communities in America um, have been afraid to touch and uh, to, to my dismay there are many leaders, many Muslim leaders and organizations, large well established organizations in America that have all been unwilling to challenge that sacred cow of 9-11, the official narrative. And it has hurt us tremendously. It has hurt America, and it has also hurt the Muslim community in America and abroad. Because there have been many things that have been done in the name of responding to the attacks of 9-11 that have violated uh, the norms of what is uh, supposed to be a civilized society. and and. Touching upon the this issue of um, how comfortable it can be to address and challenge the government on certain issues, but on this issue, um, not. I was listening to uh, Democracy Now. I, I think it was yesterday, as I was driving, and, and um, Amy and her crew were. They were doing another um, uh, excellent uh, program on uh, things that Americans, that their listeners, uh, both here and possibly abroad, given the, uh, the width and breadth of uh, communications these days, uh, things that they need to know. And they were having, uh, as part of their fun ride, uh, fundraising drive for Pacifica, uh, they were offering um, a DVD and a book 
and they were talking about uh, the uh, contradiction surrounding TWA's Flight 800 and uh, Gary Webb, who uh, was the courageous, uh, now deceased journalist uh, who pulled the cover off of the CIA's drug dealing uh, during the Reagan administration to support the Contras. I mean, and as I was driving and listening to the program, I was again uh, marveling at how um, valuable this kind of information is, uh, but how you know, when it, and, and thinking about it within the context of what we were going to be dealing with here today, why this issue can't receive that same level of, uh, of courageous advocacy, journalistic advocacy, advocacy uh, investigative prowess, or just willingness to, to speak out. I'll never forget years ago when one of the former producers of Pacifica right here in New York at WBAI contacted me. Uh, because he wanted to give me a copy of a tape, an audio tape, uh, of the government paid agent provocateur that was involved in the World Trade Center bombing of 1993, the Egyptian Imad Salem. And so I received this call from the producer. Um, and I don't think he's there at WBI anymore, but, uh, you know, he had heard uh, some of the, uh, I think what, what he had, what had happened is I think he had, um, he had seen um, the presentation that we did at the National Press Club shortly within, within a month or two after the attack of 9-11. And I remember... I remember vividly how fearful um, the Muslim establishment in the Washington area was for us to broke, uh, broke that, that, that subject at the National Press Club because they knew my position. You know, I had made it very clear from day one uh, that I didn't believe the official narrative. And I'm not an engineer, but it just didn't sound right. It didn't make sense. Um, uh, and so we did this, uh, this this conference at the National Press Club, and we had a number of respected figures within the um, African American community. Um, in fact, only two of us that were part of that, I think it was about a seven-person panel, only two of us were Muslim, and the rest were non-Muslims, a, a former 25-year veteran of the, uh, Nash, uh, of the uh, police department. Then uh, he had uh, run, um, uh, he had uh, already uh, retired, uh, but he was the executive director then of the National Black Police Association. Uh, we had um, uh, a professor from Howard University uh, in Kiji, in Ki, in Kiji Taifa, I believe her name is. Um, we had uh, Reverend Raylan Hagler um, and a few others. It, it, it was a very, very um, uh, provocative discussion we had on 9-11 and, and its aftermath. And again, this came within a month or two of the tragedy, uh, and I, I, there's a you can go to the uh, uh, the archives of um, C-SPAN because they did cover it, and you can actually pull the video up. So anyway, he saw the video, and he ended up contacting me because we were the ones that had organized this uh, presentation, and he said he had something he wanted to send me, he wanted to give me, so he. Uh, a few days later, I received in the mail this audio CD, and it was fascinating. I mean, this is, you know, the Egyptian agent provocateur, uh, former uh, colonel, I think he was, in the Egyptian military, who had been working for a number of years for the FBI. I think his uh, FBI handler, I think his name was Tom. And, 
you know, here he is because of the uh, lack of trust that existed between him and his handlers. He felt that as an insurance policy, he needed to start taping some of their conversations. And in this one conversation of, of, of what was sent to me, here he is talking about the bombing of the World Trade Center and how wonderful it was, how, how much, you know, and he's talking to his FBI handler. And, and, and he's, uh, they're, they're, you know, one of the prickly things that he's talking about is a need for more money, etc. And talking about the operation that had just taken place. And, and, I, and I thought to myself then, I mean, when I received it, how many times has this been played over Pacifica Radio? They have possession of it. How many times has this been played? I, I, I never heard it. I'm sure that it was played at least once, but I never heard it. And um, it, it gets back to the whole issue of fear and how even folks and institutions, uh, organizations that normally would be courageous when it comes to certain issues, they can shy away from, you know, the sacred cows of the, you know, this, this political propagandistic machinery if the cow is big enough and terrifying enough. And that's what this 9-11 issue represents. Um, it, no, without question, it has been the basis of intensified war on a people that had nothing, even if the scenario of 9-11 was as they claimed it is. I mean, the people that are being directly impacted, who are being killed, who are being maimed, who are having their sons and now daughters imprisoned for, you know, insane uh, periods of time for what, according to the government, are aspirational offenses. I mean, no material offense took place, but the government claims they wanted to do X, Y, and Z. They were planning to do X, Y, and Z, and nine times out of ten, they're planning to do this uh, 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 with an agent provocateur being paid for by the government in the mix, aiding them on, encouraging them. And so, you know, and and... And I'm telling you, I mean, there are, are young men. So, uh, there was a, um, one of the former top deputies of, uh, of the Attorney General um, of the Bush administration, the Attorney General Ashcroft. Ashcroft. A, a, a deputy by the name of Viet Den. He spoke at the ADA, the American um, Bar. Bar Association Conference in Naples, Florida in January of 2002. And in his presentation, he said he, he was the first high-ranking government official to admit that the government was engaged in not just racial but religious profiling. He admitted it. He admitted that the government was targeting young Muslims between the ages of 18 and 35. And during the Q&A period, when the question arose, what is the basis, what is, what is the basis of the criteria that you are using for this targeting, this, this profiling? He said the same criteria that Al-Qaeda is using. Young men between the ages of 18 and 35 who come from uh, uh, countries where Al-Qaeda has a strong presence. That could be anywhere. It could be predominantly Muslim countries. It can be countries like America and Britain and France that have Muslim minorities that appear to be growing. But he openly admitted that 18 to 35, and what we have seen since 9-11 is in institutionalized madness in the name of national security, in the, in the name of a war on terrorism, that is targeting and taking away young men, primarily within this age bracket, and now increasingly young women as well. But what is significant to note is that this didn't begin with 9-11. What 9-11 did 